Are there any Australians here in the room? Yes. Um, so you might be able to tell from my accent I'm from Australia. And back home, we have a drinking tradition as well for special occasions, and it's called a shoey. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but basically you pour like a shot in a shoe and you drink it from the shoe, which sounds disgusting, but it's a thing that Aussies do. So, you know, it, this, this, this shot is a lot of fun, but you'll have a lot to learn from Australians. Um, all right, so yeah, thank you very much for being here. I'm really stoked. Um, the presentation today is called On Your Oceans 11 Team, I'm the AI Guy. Um, even though I'm a girl, it just has a better ring to it. I need to maybe find a better title. But this is my second time at DEF CON and my first time speaking. And I'm a little bit jet lagged because of the, the trip. And I'm speaking four times this week. So forgive me if I'm a bit <laughs> tired and like forgetting all the, the order of the slides for various presentations. You sort of submit things and I didn't actually expect to get all of them in. So I'll be giving this talk um, a little later in the AI village as well, and I gave a similar one at B-Sides. But um, yeah, as you can probably tell from the, the description and the title of the talk, I'm an AI person. So maybe the casino part has kind of been shoehorned into an AI security talk, but <laughs> I, th I think it, it makes sense for Vegas, right? We want it to be, um, to be sort of relevant. I thought it'd be an interesting topic to sort of go through AI security. Um, but before I get into the topic, can I get a show of hands um, if you're like a cyber person, if you consider yourself a cyber person? Okay, and what about the people who would consider themselves an AI person? Cool, okay. And, and anyone who finds these robot tests these days really hard and isn't sure if they're a person at all? I feel like that's the camp I sometimes sit in. Um, okay, so I suspected that the crowd would mostly be cyber people, so um, the talk is uh, focused on sort of um, explaining AI security in a way for, for cyber folks. So there's a little bit of theory at the beginning and I apologize for that. And if you're an AI person, please don't come at me. Um, but before I, now I know a little bit about who you are. Um, who am I? Um, I'm pretty sure I'm a human, even though I fail the robot test sometimes. But um, I'm in AI security. I've been working at the intersection of AI and security for about 10 years now. My undergraduate was in physics and I didn't really know what to do with it. So like many physicists, I went into data science. And so I worked as a data scientist um, in Australia in a consulting company for a while, mostly on defense projects. Um, I had my quarter life crisis and moved to the United States and worked at a startup. Um, then during COVID, I moved back to Australia and worked in the Australian government. And that's when I did my PhD in machine learning security. And I found that at the time, um, when I started working in the field in 2021, no one was really talking about machine learning security. People are now, fortunately. Um, but that's why about a year ago, I left my job and I started my company, Maleva Security Labs. And we're a, an Australian-based startup. Um, we provide workshops and training in AI security, and we just got funding to do our first tech product, which is exciting. But you can also find me at Harriet Hacks on various social media platforms. Um, maybe you can find me there if you want. It's, it's a bit hacky. Like, we all got to start somewhere, so please be forgiving. But our objectives today are to hack the casino. Um, we've probably all heard of some pretty high profile casino related hacks um, in the cyberspace, but I really wanted to explore the AI dimension, um, specifically because we are at the sort of inflection point where so many organizations, including casinos, are adopting AI now, um, and most of them are inherently insecure, so I wanted to test this. So we're going to start with some exploration work. Um, I didn't know much about casinos when I like, came up with this topic, so that, that was part of it. Um, then we're going to hack the facial recognition AI. Um, and then I guess we have to think of some lessons learned in AI security, right? So why did I pick the casino? Apart from thinking it would sort of fit for the Las Vegas DEF CON context. Um, so much AI is vulnerable. However, people only seem to care when you lose a lot of money or when there's a big hit on your brand reputation. And casinos are a really good example of an organization like this where you know, the casino always wins, right? So bringing people in the door and having people trust your brand and want to you know, have entertainment when you're definitely statistically going to lose money um, is tough. And so thinking about security from that context is really important. But it's also a good analogy for literally every organization right now that's adopting AI. Um, so a few disclaimers before I start. Um, I worked with Casino Canberra on this. I, you know that I'm from Australia. Well, I'm from a town in Australia called Canberra. Does anyone know Canberra? Yay! 
Yeah, Canberra's, I, I don't know, I have a love-hate relationship with Canberra. It's pretty boring, but it's um, got a great quality of life. Um, and, you know, it, it's got some things going for it. But we, it's our political capital, for those of you who might not know that. Um, a lot of people think Sydney's our capital, but it's, it's actually Canberra. So imagine DC, but like one fourteenth of the size, because um, Australia is one fourteenth of the population of the United States. So we only have one casino, and I'm really glad that they were willing to be, you know, really cooperative with, with me on this. So, um, you know, massive thank you to Casino Canberra. Um, so they are our town's best casino, so that, that's pretty exciting. Um, as a side note, in my Uber ride over here, my Uber driver said that his son vacationed in Australia and their honeymoon was in Canberra and they loved it so much that they named their child, like, Giovanni Canberra. And <laughs> I, I don't know, any, anyone who's familiar with Canberra would just find that shocking. But anyway, um, so going on with the disclaimers, um, so obviously the attacks are, are real, but you know I'm an ethical hacker. I you know I care about Casino Canberra. I'm not literally showing you how to attack their systems or you know specific AI systems. Um, and like I said, the talk is aimed at, at cyber at cyber folk. So a little bit about casinos for the people um, like me who, who might not have known about casinos. Um, they obviously like a lot of money. They have a controversial history. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why that history is sort of controversial. Um, casinos are a hotspot for money laundering um, because it's an easy way to move funds around. Um, particularly in Australia, there's been some controversy lately. Our two big casino brands, Star and Crown, um, had to pay big fines because they didn't comply with any money laundering laws, um, and there's been royal commissions and stuff. Um, it, it's the same in other countries as well. Um, casinos are getting a little bit of heat. So security is important. They use AI, obviously, otherwise this talk wouldn't have gone as I planned. Um, and they use AI for lots of different reasons, and as I'll go into later, um, they, they re rely specifically on facial recognition and, and person detection. Um, but the landscape is really interesting when it comes to casinos, because just like any organization, they're trying to figure out exactly what the most strategic or the, the best way of actually adopting and integrating AI is. And just like any organization, they have to rely on third party providers for the most part. Or they can bring in their own consultants, but that's sort of expensive and not all casinos can necessarily do that. And there are also a few companies that provide AI services to casinos that are, uh, you know, already um, providing things like chips and, and cards to casinos as well. So it's a very small space. Um, when I first started this talk, I thought that things like card counting would, would be a, a, a use of AI in casinos, and it's not. Um, so you're probably familiar with, with card counting, um, and it's not illegal, it's considered advantage play. So a casino, however, does have the discretion to like, prevent people from playing there for any reason. So if a person is very ostentatiously card counting and winning a lot of money, um, probably the casino is going to not want to have them there. Um, but it was interesting because I, I expected that things like card counting would be a big use case for AI, um, and it wasn't. So how do we actually hack an AI? Um, the, sorry, this is the first bad joke of the day. Um, so when I first told my mum I worked in AI, she said, oh darling, what are you doing working in artificial insemination? Because... <laughs> I know that was a pity laugh, but thank you. Um, she works in medicine, and so to her, that's what AI is. And so obviously for most people here, AI is artificial intelligence. But even though we know it means those two words, what people have in their mind when they think of what artificial intelligence is definitely differs. Um, some people imagine Skynet and things like artificial general intelligence. Some people imagine um, algorithms, machine learning systems. Some people just imagine anything that's sort of at the cutting edge of technology. Um, so when we think about how to hack an AI system, we really have to think about like the actual technology that we're trying to hack rather than sort of a, some sort of AGI related goal. So I'm, I'm focusing very much on machine learning models. But if we really think about the history of AI, and if we think about it as just something that does something a human might otherwise have done, um, I mean, the idea of hacking AI has been around for a long time. Um, so 
this is a, an example from a casino context. So as we know that there are, there are no random numbers in computers, right? It has to be an algorithm. And so there are some pretty high profile cases of people being able to basically hack the algorithm. Um, people who have access to sort of like the seed information of these algorithms um, have been able to like steal money, uh, pretty large sums. In 1995, Ron Harris was able to steal $100,000 this way because he knew about the algorithm and was able to predict the next numbers very successfully in, uh, in a game of Keno. I hope they're not having more fun than us because they're very loud. Do I need more bad jokes? I don't think you really want that either. Um, so that's one example of hacking an AI, I guess. Um, and the other is sort of card counting. So if we think about it, the reason that the casino always wins right is because the game is statistically in their favor. And that goes anywhere from sort of a 2% to a 25% advantage where 25% would sort of be like the slot machines, and then 2% would be a game of blackjack. And that's why card counting in blackjack is most likely to be able to uh, reduce the casino's favor, because if you, um, if you use um, like perfect strategy, which is just doing the, the plays that are statistically most likely to have you win, um, plus card counting, you can reduce that to like um, closer, to, closer to zero. Um, and the only reason that the slot machines are 25% max is because of regulation anyway, otherwise the casinos would probably want them to be higher. But that's an example of algorithm hacking too, because you're hacking the statistical process of, of being able to do that. So when we think about the modern iteration of hacking an AI system, um, we come to the realm of adversarial machine learning. And everyone probably has seen this picture before, so I feel like I have to show it. But basically the idea is that you're able to um, create specifically crafted adversarial examples that you can then input into a machine learning model to make it not do what it's meant to, basically. So this example is from 10 years ago, and this is like an image of a panda where you can have an adversarial example superimposed on top of that, uh, which is just um, perturbations to the image specifically crafted based on the target model that you're trying to attack. And it can disrupt or deceive the model. Um, really successfully, even though a human can't recognize it. So adversarial machine learning is the, the field that my PhD was in, and you can consider it sort of the offensive side of AI security. It, it's basically the field that is coming up with the attacks. But it's uh, traditionally been very academic. Recently, we're starting to see more examples of these kinds of things in real life. Um, so being able to actually uh, you know, implement some change in the physical world that's able to prevent, say, autonomous vehicles from being able to recognize stop signs so they drive straight through. And in terms of the landscape of adversarial machine learning attacks, it's massive. It's just exploded over the last 10 years. And if we think about all of the different attack surfaces represented by AI systems, um, so on the top, things like convolutional neural networks, which is a machine learning model really good at computer vision, um, versus something like a transformer along the bottom, which is very good at natural language processing and the backbone of things like GPT. Um, they're very different attack surfaces, but many different adversarial machine learning methods now exist that are able to very successfully um, do bad things at each stage of that attack, at that attack surface. So most of the time, these attacks require you to actually change something about the object itself, right? So you have the panda example before, we have things like adversarial glasses that prevent a person being recognized from detection. You have uh, like a jumper that can also hide a person from person detection. Um, and the example I love on the bottom right is this um, DARPA model that was meant to be used in sort of urban warfare environments to detect people. And they asked their Marines to try and red team that model. And they found that the Marines could just act not like people and very successfully deceive the model. So they did things like put cardboard boxes on their heads. They waved branches around and acted like trees, whatever that means. And they were very successfully able to hack the model. The, the challenge with all of these things is that you're actually required to change something about the object itself that's being classified. Um, there are some examples of like attacks where you don't need to change the thing itself. This is called an adversarial sticker. So if I put this next to something else, a model is going to um, like predict that this is a, a toaster. So if I put this next to a banana, which is the sort of the example that they, they give, um, instead of recognizing the banana, the model is going to see a toaster instead. Um, however, this is sort of challenging because like this is very obvious. Like if I put this next to a banana, I'd be like, that's not meant to be there. Um, that's a banana. But a model doesn't see it that way. So I had a thought. I was like, what if you could 
like change something about what's in the image frame itself, but you didn't have to perturb the actual image. Um, and so I came up with this technique called distributed adversarial regions. Um, and this is part of my PhD where I was sort of coming up with this attack. And so the intent for this was largely in urban camouflage environments. So being able to do things like have um, specially crafted boys around um, ships, for example, like military ships, so you, so you think it's a, a container ship instead, or having it around other different kinds of military platforms. Um, and if I can easily get the video working, um, this is just a very quick example of what this would look like. So if you have these sorts of buoys around, um, that's a Japanese U-boat, um, you can actually prevent the model from recognising that platform. Um, also, don't come at me for them not being real boys. It would have been a very expensive endeavour to like put, <laughs> put boys around a, a vessel. Um, the thing about being able to digitally manipulate the images is that um, you know it, it's a really good surrogate for not being able to actually change the physical environment um, and being able to test it. So I, I wanted to see if I could apply this technique to things like um, facial recognition for this casino context. So how does this relate to casinos? I assume everyone here is familiar with the Ocean's Eleven franchise. Yes, I mean, it's, it's a heist, you know, like we don't need to get too, too thingy about it. The idea is that we're basically just bypassing all of these different um, security levels that they have in a really cool way. Ideally, there's um, like bourbon and, and suits and George Clooney. Um, I did not get to have a George Clooney in my life um, doing this talk, but that's okay. Um, so we get the premise of the heist. This is what I wanted to do. I wanted to understand uh, Casino Canberra's, I don't know, uh, AI operational environment. Um, then I'm going to pick some target models to create this attack. I'm then going to, you know, implement the, the, the DARs, the distributed adversarial regions. I'm going to test how I can sort of disguise them in different ways. And then lessons learned and sort of next steps. So the first step. I, I mentioned my PhD. I've been doing it part time for a really long time. So I feel like I should be finished, but I'm not. Um, now this is annoying because it's really hard to like simultaneously try and build a startup and also finish a PhD. My supervisors, only one of them knows I'm here right now. The others think I'm in Canberra, like working, <laughs> working from the university. Um, so don't tell them. But the good thing about still doing a PhD is not only do I get really good student discounts, but people are very helpful. So if I reach out to people and I tell them that I want to do something as part of my PhD, people generally say yes. It helps that I'm also sort of like nice and polite and you know, people are always just very helpful. Um, so this is what I did with Casino Canberra and they were very willing to help, which was nice of them. So this is Casino Canberra. Maybe it doesn't look like the Bellagio or the MGM Grand, but like they have a, a red carpet um, it's very nice. It's right next to our civic centre. Um, it's between there and the convention centre. Um, it's, you know, they, they, they do okay. Um, they're very excited about a new upgrade that, that they're doing. They're going to get a lot bigger. There'll be a hotel. Um, they, they've got it going on. So as part of this upgrade, they're thinking about implementing artificial intelligence for the first time. Something I was really interested to learn through doing this sort of research was that um, facial recognition and person detection was by far the largest, um, like the most important form of AI for casinos, but it's obviously very unequal in how casinos are able to adopt them. So all of the casinos we have here in Vegas would very much rely on using AI and they would have very mature practices around it. And in fact, they would actually build their casinos using this AI in mind. So when we walk around the casino, you might notice that sometimes there are like sort of narrow corridors that you're forced to walk through, and that's to make sure that your faces are actually caught by these cameras. So as, as a casino like Casino Canberra is thinking about their redesign, this is very much inherent in how they actually decide to design the casino so that they can use things like facial recognition to identify money launderers or known criminals or card counters, I guess. Um, also problem gamblers. Um, there are some you know, nice use cases for it as well. They want to make sure that people aren't gambling too much, just the right amount. Um, and things like number plate recognition for cars is also really important. 
Um, but in terms of AI, this is very much a computer vision problem. So being able to see things in the environment and understand it, they don't really have a lot of use for other kinds of AI right now anyway, not, not things like chatbots or signal processing, that's not, that's not really in their realm. Um, but right now they're also very much dependent on people, just being able to um, like identify those known people and then log them in the system. Um, that's, that's very much still dependent on, on humans, even here. So what I did next was I need to choose a victim, right? Um, like I said, Casino Canberra doesn't currently use AI, so I couldn't really use any like live face recognition that they were using right now. So instead I had to pick uh, an appropriate victim that would be close enough to something they would use. And you might think that this is a problem, however it's not fortunately because of this principle in machine learning and its convergence. I don't know if this works with a big crowd, um, but I might try some audience participation. I don't know. Does anyone want to shout out and guess what this number might represent? I actually can't hear anyone anyway. So I'm going <laughs> to assume that maybe one of you was right. Um, so this number actually represents um, quite, so some significant research into similarity of models. So if you have uh, a model trained on similar data to do similar things, you end up with a similar model, like basically the same model. Um, and this is actually really significant because a lot of the models that companies rely on and produce as part of their IP are very much or, large, or you know, exactly the same as open source models. And in fact, a lot of the time they do actually just use open source models and then do a bit of fine tuning. And that doesn't necessarily change the model itself. It certainly doesn't change the architecture. It might change, uh, you know, sort of how you apply it to different use cases. But it, a lot of research has been done to show that if you compare two models, an open source model with uh, like a, a model that is a company's IP to do things like facial recognition, they are 95 to 99% similar. It's a minimum of 95% similarity, which is really significant because it means that I don't really need to, you know, do anything too um, difficult to be able to find a good victim model. So that's convergence. So there's a lot of different victim models that I wanted to test. Um, like I mentioned, I already did this attack for things like urban camouflage, so being able to do things like object detection and testing some of those models. Um, I also added some of these facial recognition models um, as well. They, these are just a few of the, the open source models available at the moment. So the next step is to create these distributed adversarial regions. Um, and this is a fairly boring diagram, so maybe I'll show you instead a, a slightly less boring video. Um, it, it's very hard trying to create fun demos for this. I don't know. So um, maybe I need to find a way. So, so this is the, um, the the video that I'm testing on. Right. This is me walking up to the the detection, and this is uh, me implementing the attack on one of my target models. Um, so I'll talk through the method because it takes a couple of minutes. But basically all I need to do to implement this attack is to uh, perform an optimization algorithm on the video in question to identify different regions where if I perturb them in certain ways, um, they're going to cause a misclassification, which sounds really easy. Um, but the, the difficult thing is in sort of making those areas not too obvious or at least being able to pick uh, a few different regions that could reasonably actually be altered. And so this code shows me being able to like perform that optimization uh, based on one of these victim models, um, making a prediction on, on this video. If you're not a person who finds the code interesting, uh, maybe at least the thing you can take away is that it only takes a minute to do. Like it, it's very easy, um, and I don't even need to use like an existing. Um, pre-built library or anything, it, it's just an optimization algorithm. So, so when I said before that there's over a hundred different kinds of adversarial machine learning attacks, um, it's, it's really easy to just sort of build them yourself. It, it's all optimization at the end of the day. So we can see on the screen here that the, the code read out no match found and then when I add the perturbed image, um, sorry, so there, there was a match found 
um, for the clean image and then when I added the distributed adversarial regions there was no match found. So the interesting thing about being able to like do the testing or maybe not the most interesting thing actually um, but the, the process of actually thinking about the attack surface and let me skip through here. Um, thinking about the actual attack surface and what we're like affecting in this attack. So all computer vision, most computer vision relies on convolution, convolutional neural networks because they're the most powerful sort of model to be able to do this. Um, and being able to create attacks that work for most of them is actually pretty easy. So if we think about facial recognition, the way that it works is that it, it sort of takes your facial ge geometry and then is able to compress it into an embedding space. Um, and being able to identify clusters and sort of relationships between them and then um, based on that mapping, you know, be able to identify me versus not me, I guess. And so when I have that information, I can do things like create specific patterns that change that distribution. So if I go back and play um, this other recording, I want to be able to test doing things like um, creating jewelry. So this is this is the example that I'm testing. So the the challenging thing about building models or thinking about model security is that all of these models that are that I'm testing on, it doesn't actually take much to be able to disrupt them. Um, creating this attack is really very simple. Just sit here a minute. Let me skip back to the slides while this uh, while this loads. So maybe it doesn't look so interesting, but being able to do that attack and like have it not recognize me, um, I guess that's a way of saying that I hacked the model, right? I mean, it was able to not recognize me because I created these sort of adversarial earrings that, you know, when the model looks at that, that image of me, um, it doesn't recognize me. When I test it, um, that's the important part of the process, right, from a machine learning perspective. This looks very boring too. Um, I, I tested all of those different models and I wanted to see the extent to which the attack actually works and decreases the confidence level of that attack. Um, as a way of distilling all of the sort of the boring columns in the graph, the number that we ended up with was a 40.4% reduction in like confidence. Um, so what does that actually mean? Is, is that significant? Um, when I implemented this attack on the urban camouflage environments, um, it was more successful, honestly. It's, it's a bit easier for things like ships and military platforms because those models tend to rely a lot more on context. And in facial recognition, it's a little bit harder because a lot of models would tend to um, look at the geometry um, slightly differently. But 40.4% on the whole of all of the models that I tested is actually really significant because that means that if I have, say, a confidence threshold of um, like 90%, so a model looks at an image of me and says with 99% confidence that it is me, being able to decrease that confidence by around 40% means that if it was originally 99%, then it's going to be 40% um, less than that and it's not going to meet that threshold. So I don't actually need to affect a massive change in the model to be able to have it not recognize who I am. And I guess the way of thinking about that is by calling it context. But really what it means is that most of the models that are already out there, all of the open source models that we use and data scientists use and organizations in fact use and then fine tune are vulnerable to an attack like this, which is really very simple, you know? Um, what I did by adding, uh, you know, regions of perturbation to myself is really, is, is definitely not the most, sophisticated, the, the most sophisticated kind of attack. Um, yesterday I was at an AI security forum 
And it was amazing because everyone was sort of talking about all of the latest breakthroughs in, in AI security and how we can make models extremely secure and the, the technical and the governance things. The, the really challenging thing though is that most organizations don't have that existing level of maturity. And the kinds of models that they're using are these kinds of open source models that only take a few regions to be disrupted and to cause a misclassification. And thinking about the, uh, I guess, thinking about what this actually means is really significant because while I've applied this to a computer vision use case, so this could work for things like retina scanning, number plate recognition as well, without actually having to change the object itself, but just changing things around the object, um, really just highlights how brittle most models are. Um, it also highlights that while I did this in a computer vision use case, because that's sort of what, what works for this um, facial recognition casino context, exactly the same kind of attack could be applied to different domains as well. So things like uh, natural language processing and signal processing. And when we think about what natural language processing and signal processing actually are in an AI uh, use case context, natural language processing does all the, the cybersecurity applications as well. So being able to identify uh, malware, being able to um, identify like good versus bad code, um, they're natural language processing problems. And if we can add perturbances that are actually not about the, the thing that we're trying to classify, but are still able to disrupt the model, that's a real problem. It's the same in the signal processing space. That's things like um, RF and audio and, um, and LiDAR, you know, all, all the signal processing problems we have, medical imaging, um, being able to add perturbances that aren't even related to the thing that you're trying to classify represent a massive problem. Um, I did some other research that looked at this in large language models as well. Uh, this isn't exactly a cool demo, though I, I wish it could be, but basically I was looking at being able to add different sort of ideas to language models and see if they could, um, if they would sort of take up that information and have it alter the messages that they were giving. And we found that um, after sort of a few simulations and a few iterations of being able to add this additional kind of like noise material, they did actually successfully adopt these other, um, these other ideas, even if that wasn't um, sort of encoded into them already. The, when, when we think about attacking machine learning models, the, the challenging thing as well is that it's not the same as cybersecurity. Like when we think about testing a model and identifying uh, what, what makes a good model, data scientists will use scores like this. Um, so they look at accuracy, they look at precision, uh, recall and F1 score are sort of related to precision as well. They look at all the statistical um, functions for a model that makes it um, like largely accurate but the security is rarely ever considered and it's, very, it's a very different problem to a cybersecurity problem. I mean, what does it mean to hack an AI system itself? You know, I, I sort of looked at that 40.4% number and felt a little bit disappointed. Like, I sort of wish that it was a bit more definitive. But the thing with hacking an AI system is that it's not really a, a binary, um, did, did it work or did it not? but it's more about on the whole, we were able to reduce the classification confidence of a model. So it's more, it's better to think about it as part of the kill chain. And quite a lot of the attacks at the moment are very much uh, sort of like a Stuxnet equivalent. You know, they're, they're very complicated, they're very difficult to implement. That's why there's this idea that they're a bit more academic than, than realistic or practitioner based. Whereas even though being able to add like these, these random distributed regions to an image um, isn't all that sophisticated, that the fact that it works and it actually disrupts a model most of the time is a real problem. And it's, it's sort of more akin to like the, the DDoS attack equivalent in a machine learning sense. Because even though that number was 40.4%, um, in our experience, if you're able to leverage some sort of AI attack or some sort of adversarial machine learning attack, you're able to hack the system 100% of the time because there's always a way that you can adapt it for whichever case study you need to. So the fact that so many organizations are reliant on these like inherently insecure models is a real problem. 
because AI security is real. So if, if we're thinking about like next steps and, and lessons learned from an attack like this, um, we already have a few companies starting to put out reports about the incidence of AI security related attacks. Uh, and it's, it's changing a lot. Like it's uh, encouraging that since I started in the field, it's definitely uh, being taken more seriously and we're starting to see these incidents. Um, but it's, it's really unfortunate because we have so many lessons from the field of cybersecurity that we could bring into the field of AI security, but they just aren't. So it's really important that all of the cyber folk in the room are thinking about how to solve these sorts of problems in AI security as well. Some of the, um, as I mentioned, the, the, the interview with uh, Casino Canberra was part of uh, many other interviews we've done. And we, we've got these interesting insights already. 94% um, of the like, people and organizations we spoke to could articulate how they use AI. Um, even if maybe it's not what everyone would define as AI, they, they had an idea of how they use AI. Um, but only 8% could articulate how they secure their AI. And most of the time, it's never really considered at all. The other reason I wanted to use the casino case study was because a casino is a really good sort of analogy for a society that it's starting to um, be built around surveillance as well. Like casinos are built with surveillance in mind and societies are increasingly sort of moving towards using more AI, specifically facial recognition AI to do important things as well. So the, the, the important thing to think about from like the, the, the perspective of actually what you can do with the knowledge of these attacks is that even now in the casino environment, it's, it's still entirely reliant on people and process. And especially as organizations like casinos are going through this inflection point in adopting different AI technologies, um, being able to actually like govern that and implement it well is still really hard. And even though over here we have lots of very um, you know, technical and, and mature conversations about it. Most organizations are, are out there are still really grappling with how to do it. It's, you know, it's still so, so reliant on having people to surveil it. And at the end of the day, you know, I went into, you know, Casino Canberra. I asked very nicely if I could, you know, try hacking their things and they said yes. So what does it really mean? Um, in terms of what Casino Canberra was able to do with this, it's, it's tough because they're reliant on third party AI. So all you can do is sort of ask the questions and hope that you, know, you keep it in mind. But we're really so reliant on these organizations that provide the AI and there's no regulation around how they have to actually secure them or make sure that they're robust. So it's really challenging, but at least being able to ask the question, um, it sort of helps. So, um, so that's it. I, I am talking tomorrow as well um, about my experience in the Australian government. I worked at an intelligence agency, so I'm also speaking in the Policy Village um, on one of the creative stages about um, sort of the policy element of these AI security attacks as well. Um, so thank you so much for coming and please do keep in touch.